Welcome to Camera Shake Podcast, episode 137, the podcast where we discuss photography, videography, and anything and everything that's got anything to do with any of that, with me, Kirsten Lutz. And in today's episode, we have another awesome guest. But before I announce who it is, I have a favor to ask. When I checked our analytics, it turns out that 70% of you listening or watching on YouTube have not subscribed to this channel. And whilst that is absolutely awesome, if you like this channel or like this video, please do me a flavor and hit the subscribe button. I'd really love to get that down to about 50%. So click like, hit subscribe and leave a comment. It'll really help our channel being found. So buckle up, grab a cold one and let's shake it up right after this. Before we get started, let me just say a quick thank you to our sponsor, DVE Store. DVE Store's mission is to help you create better video and provide you with the tools necessary to explore your creativity. If you have any digital video equipment needs, whether that's camera equipment, audio gear or lighting and much more, you can check them out at dvestore.com. Thanks to DVE Store for the high def video. You'll find the link in the description, of course. That being said, let's get right into it. Now, today's guest is none other than the all the way from Sweden, the Scottish expat, hatshot and portrait photographer. Give it up for Sean Luthway. Sean, man, how are you? I'm not too bad, yourself? I'm good, I'm good. How things, man? How, how have you been? It's been a while since you've been on the show. It has, it has been a while. I think it is about, just about over a year and a half. Um, things have this year sort of taken off quite nicely. Their work's coming in normally January to February, and February's quite quiet. Uh, so it is quite nice that people are starting to come back so soon after Christmas. But, you know, actors have to have work and they have to have good headshots. So thankfully they, they've remembered me and come back to me. So that's good. <laughs> So you're um, you're a headshot photographer, predominantly, or headshot and portrait photographer, I should yes. say. Yes. Um, and of course, you specialize in actors and artists. I do. Yeah. yeah. Um, is is that very seasonal? When you mentioned that it usually quiets down a little bit after Christmas, or? Uh, yeah, I think primarily uh, here in Sweden. I think it might be the same in Austria as well. Uh, in the in the winter time, and especially in the summertime, for about two or three months, Stockholm just closes. Uh, I think with uh, winter time, people like to have their winter holidays, so they're basically not in Stockholm at all. And obviously, with Christmas being an expensive hobby, uh, people don't aren't that flush <laughs> flush with cash. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what's changed now, but I'm I'm happy that people are coming back to me. And uh, the um, yeah, it's it's good. I mean, this time last year, I didn't have any until like mid middle of February, so. For me, it's, it's it's a good start, and like within the first week, I had three three clients, so I'm happy with that. Wow, is that? Do you think it slows down because it gets really cold? Like, how cold is it where you are at the moment? A couple of weeks back, it was minus twenty five. Whoa! Uh, but it seems to be the colder it is, the less cold it feels. I mean, the week before that, it was minus five, but it was like a wet cold in the UK. It's a wet cold over here. It's a dry cold. Uh, my first winter over here was in 2008, and I wore my kilt down watching the fireworks, and it was minus 25, and it really didn't feel like it. It didn't. It felt. It didn't feel warm, but it didn't feel ice cold. If there was a wind in it, then it'd be a completely different story. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it because a kilt is made from? It's like wool, isn't it? It is wool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's uh, the one I have. It's like 13 yards of wool, so it is like. Um, have you ever he lifted like a heavy, heavy leather trench coat? It's 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 quite heavy. It's probably like five or six kilos. It's it's, it's a heavy bit of equipment. So, oh, you don't want to get that wet. No, <laughs> <laughs> I'm heavy enough as it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, well, it's a funny thing. Um, I it was it, well. Let's put it this way. It, it got it got cold in the UK as well. Um, although it's warmed up a little bit again, but before Christmas it was certainly it's it quite freezing. And um, I, I made the mistake of wearing like a, a woolly type of coat um, on the Vespa. And whilst it felt super warm, like I was really yeah. nice and, you know, nice and cozy. In it. And I kind of thought, oh, I'll get on the Vespa. I'll just ride down to the superstore. You know, no problem. It's just a couple of miles. But boy, man, the wind goes right through it. Ah, oh, <laughs> man, that wasn't I cool. I noticed that. I noticed, I've got like a, a woolen type fleece. 
the insides of fleece, but the outside's wool. But when you walk fast, the wind catches it. It's just like wind going through a sieve. It's just, yeah. just no protection at all. Yeah, and that's you know that's that's a noticeable difference to leather, for example. You know when yeah. when they wear like a leather jacket or something on the bike, is oh, on the I say on the bike on the Vespa. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, then it is like nothing gets through that. It's yeah, it's, it's a total proof. windbreaker. So yeah, yeah. Cool, man. So you're busy again. That's that's awesome. Because um, the last time we spoke was in the pandemic. Yeah, it was. Oh yeah, yeah. That was that was that was quite uh, horrific. Um, I mean, I think since since then, I think we've had like two, two or three uh, restrictions. You know, having to wear masks on public transport, wear masks in all public uh, environments. So people that they just they just didn't want to risk it. Uh, I think by the time the third one came around, I think people were like, okay, well, nothing happened to me over the last two, uh, you know, restrictions. So people on the third time, they were a lot more. Uh, acceptable to go on out on the streets and go into people's houses, but uh, one event I had to, I had to wear a mask, uh, which I offer people to do during that session. And she also asked me to wear rubber gloves as well, like surgical gloves. I was like, okay, not a problem at all. I've got a pair of rubber gloves that we use for when we sort of inspect the dog's teeth and stuff like that. So I was, I was stabbed in. I'm very hot blooded, so like, the window's open. She's freezing cold, so I have to close the window. And I just look like I'm a, a serial killer with sweat dropping down the head. So it wasn't a nice look at all. <laughs> so I, t- I take it um, there are no, no more restrictions in Sweden now? Uh, no, there, there are p- people have have wear masks just because they want to wear masks. I think in like the, uh, uh, when you go to like a, um, the medical center you have to wear a mask that's mandatory but in the supermarkets public transport you don't have to wear one if you want to wear one you can but uh, I've, I've started to see quite a few more people now starting to wear masks out outside so uh, but we'll see what's, ha- what's going to happen with this uh, if there's going to be a fourth pandemic so I don't know we'll see uh, yeah I, uh, just a flu pandemic apparently is going on here at the moment oh god yeah everybody's <laughs> like they're, they're yeah. falling like 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 dominoes <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. I mean, thankfully, uh, I mean, I haven't had the flu in about five or six years now, so I, I'm either very lucky or I just don't go out that much <laughs> to be able to catch it. So, but uh, yeah, the, um, the, I think the UK, especially the elderly, they really get hit for six when the flu season comes around. So, oh, and kids, man, I, you know, that's I've got kids, so it's that's it. <laughs> I've got but kids. She, and- it's, 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 it's like kids in a, it's like a, a petri dish going to school come back yeah it's crazy it's yeah, crazy it's kids and my wife's a teacher so it's you know we oh, can't we can't whammy. escape it double whammy <laughs> oh man anyway so in this episode today we're going to talk about portrait photography obviously and um we're gonna basically we're gonna talk about how you the listener or watcher watcher is it the watcher the viewers the audience, that's right. You, audience. the audience, that oh, covers it all. That covers audience. it all. Yeah, <laughs> how you, the audience, can improve your portrait photography. I think when you know when you first get into portrait photography, there's like you know there's a million questions that that you'd have ordinarily. You know everything from lighting to posing to you know uh, camera settings and all the rest of it. So what we'll do is we'll we'll go through everything and we'll sort of deconstruct it a little bit. Um, and uh, we'll dive into your very particular style um, of portrait photography as well, because uh, you know I, the first time I came across your imagery was actually on Instagram. This was years ago. Okay. Yeah, this was years ago. Um, and and whenever I was scrolling through my feed, you know, there'd be a headshot or, or a portrait would pop up, and I'd stop and I'd be like, "Oh, this is awesome," and it'd be like, "Oh, okay, stop on All right. Okay. The next day, I'd be scrolling. There'd be another image. I'm like. That's awesome. Who's that by? Oh, it's the same guy. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and it was such, like it was such a like recognizable, you know, yeah. style basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that you know, immediately I thought, well, oh, this is this is so interesting and so like different, you know, from virtually everything else um, I saw back then, and I still see actually uh, that it's uh, is it, that's really interesting sort of thing to to talk about within itself. Yeah. Yeah. But let's let's start from the beginning. So, um, 
for anybody who is interested in portrait photography or, or would like to get into portrait photography, um, what is the so the first number one most important thing you you th you'd say they'd have to master? I think um, personally for myself, looking back on my progression, uh, and I sort of you know after watching YouTube tutorials from Peter Hurley, uh, Jeff Rojas, etc., uh, I started to focus on using one light, and I still use one light. So use one light and use it very well. You can use either either one light to get very dramatic light if it's from one side, uh, or if it's straight on and you get a bit more of a flat light. But since I like to have a quite a cinematic feel to my portraits for the actors, I want their faces to have a bit of a um, a three D form on the screen. So uh, lights and shadows for me create that perfect combination. Uh, and the, the way I say to all of the students in here, so listen, I use one light because when you go outside on a sunny day, there's one light in the sky. People don't walk around with two light sources on their face and a reflector on the, the face. So, but for me, it's very important to get people to look exactly as they do if it was in a just in a regular situation. I, I know that some of the American portraits work very well in the states. But over here in Europe, uh, in Sweden, in the UK, uh, they can come across very um, too well lit. There's there's no shape to the face. It's there's there's the shape and contours, but it's just a bit. I don't know. I wouldn't want to say fake looking light. The light's very good, but it's just a bit. You see that type of shot all the time. Uh, so I want my headshots to stand out for using just the one light uh, and using it hopefully very well. I mean, from what I've heard from people that have shot there, they're getting headhunted from stage pool, headhunted to the States and stuff like that for two mo movies. So it's, yeah, find one light source. My first light source was a... This, 80 centimeter shoot through umbrella, uh, a light stand that was barely hold the light up, and it was just a, a one of those squiggly tight daylight bulbs that you get. And I think it was it was it wasn't enough light to go through the shoot through, so the light had to be really close to the person's face. Uh, it worked for a certain amount of time, but then you have to progress. You know whether it's through strobe. I'm continually using now uh, LED lamps. I don't use any strobe at all because the the flash affects the pupil of the eye. It dilates the eye. So people have got coloured eyes. I want their eyes to show out by not the same big black pl uh, pupil. So so yeah, using one light source and using it well. There's there's two interesting things uh, in what you just said. Well, it's many interesting things, but there's two things I want to pick out on. Um, well, one is. First of all, using one light or starting with one light is is always a great idea because one of the things I think that can happen if you you know if you watch lots of YouTube tutorials and yeah. you know you, you you watch a video about like three point lighting and you know fill yeah. light and hair lights and you know everything else it's it's easy to get overwhelmed with that and Very to confuse so. you know to get confused with that um, yeah. and yeah. I see that actually I see that I've only recently um, noticed that in a in a group. Um, um, in, in a, it was a, like a camera club related group and people were trying to teach themselves how to use studio lighting. And the yeah. thing there was that um, there were just too, you know, too many lights going on at the same time and nothing was very yeah. well controlled. Yeah. And so it, it kind of brings it back to just starting with one light, learning how to use one light and then, and then expand from there. Once yeah. you can really use one light and you really have control over it and yeah. you know what you're doing and you know what effect you're getting yeah, yeah, if you then think, okay, I want to add an edge light, yeah. or you know, whatever, or a yeah. fill, or whatever, yeah. that's fine. It is actually really easy then to build up on that. Absolutely. But, uh, I mean, for me, I, I, I do only use the one light. I now have two LED lamps, but I only use the one of them. It's a Godo SL um, sixty, I think it is, uh, and I've got a, a ninety centimeter parabolic. Um, a softbox, so that now actually allows me to um, 
really focus a light. I can feather with it so I can get full on light. And so for, for that, as you said, you know, use the one light, master it completely so you don't have to think about it. Once you've done that, then you can introduce a second line source, whether that be through a, a silver slider reflector or, as you said, you know, like a rim light off in the, the back. Um, but yeah, one light. You only sort of really need one light to get a, an effective headshot. So if people like to use three lights, good luck to them. But for me, it sort of it, it, sort, uh, it sort of drags me a bit. Uh, I, I haven't used three lights. I've used two. That was a bit cumbersome to get exactly how I want. Um, so yeah, for me, I'm more than happy just to stick with the one light. So and the other, you know, the other thing you mentioned and I thought was um, was a really awesome tip is, you know, you said when you look around, you see a lot of American style headshots uh, that are usually three light kind of scenarios. Um, then, you know, looking at a, a one light type of headshot makes that one stick out from from the crowd and surely that's a that's a really good thing to just differentiate your own work a little bit i i think so um uh, the, 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 i mean there's also plenty of um groups on instagram and facebook that you can join uh there is very uh, there is um some very influential photographers and in, coming out of the states uh, and their work is absolutely amazing uh but you know, they will offer courses or lighting uh, techniques. And uh, the work's really good, but for me, it's it's a bit too um, corporate looking for me to use as actors' headshots. And that's fair enough. But, you know, if you take out of a group, take the first 10, 15 photographs, they'll all be taken by 10 or 15 different people, yet they all look very, very similar. And whether the lighting is good, it, that work doesn't really stand out from the person next to him. And again, that there is a place for that type of light, and and I like it. It's just, it's just not my cup of tea. I like I like to have shadows. I like to have depth. So and uh, and personality. I think that's that's the I mean, other yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, because you said you know uh, a few years back, you were looking through Instagram, you saw a portrait like it who was it stockholm sean the next day oh fantastic so there is you do get a bit of a style um that is recognizable when people do scroll through their feet you know i for the for for good or for bad you know it is recognizable um so yeah the the, the some of the headshots that actors do use of mine uh some of them actually do work in casting agencies and they'll get cvs in from actors and it'll be the same thing they'll have a page a cv what they've done then it'll be the picture and without even looking at who the photographer is they'll recognize it as one of my photographs and um it's good it's good because people are actually managing to find work from the work that i give them so i'm more than happy to stick with the stick with the one light <laughs> and create what i create so i'm obviously doing something right Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, as you were saying, there's, there's a difference between corporate headshots yeah. and headshots for actors. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the one thing that I have found is there's some absolutely amazing portrait photographers in Stockholm, especially the UK. There's some amazing ones in the UK. Um, but, and it's the same thing, corporates and actors' headshots are completely different. But when portrait photographers sort of use hashtags of actors headshot on portraits for me there's a clear difference of a portrait and a headshot a portrait is to look look how good like i look uh, a headshot is to convey an image or an idea that the actor wants to give across to a casting director it's not it's like a, a plain interesting blank canvas for casting directors to see can we see this person as a doctor, can we see this person as a policeman? Yes, they go for auditions and they get it or they don't, so. So would you light a headshot and a portrait differently? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think for portraits for me, um, I mean, I do, I do love my actors' headshots, so they're always going to stay sort of very um, Zack Snyder, sort of very dark and moody. 
uh, portraits, whether it be for uh, LinkedIn headshots, they're going to be uh, the background's going to be a lot lighter, if not use a white background for that. Still use the one light, but still have a white background. And there's going to be um, the shadow's going to be a lot less harsh than it would be on an axe headshot. There will still be some shadow on one side of the face, but just not as evident as the headshots. So there, there, there is um, a bit of a difference. It's, it's quite a bit lighter. You can see all of the face. You can see this ear, you can see this ear. Whereas in the headshots, this ear is like a silhouette against a lighter background. So, so yeah, uh, I do light them a lot lighter. And it is sort of following the sort of the, the LinkedIn professional sort of, you know, career type headshot. So, and of course, I mean, your work is, um, I think it's very recognizable because um, unlike a lot of other work that I see, especially in the headshot world, where, where everything is very, um, everything pops and everything is super contrasty, your work is a lot more subtle. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a lot more sort of painterly almost. Yeah, I was going to say the the sort of the look that I'm going for, in my mind, uh, is a cinematic capture. I, I shoot my portraits landscape, you know, with the person just off to like the right hand side, so it's actually like a bit of a uh, a screenshot from a from a TV, so it makes it easier for cast and directors to imagine what they look like on on screen. Basically, uh, it is uh, I normally shoot at. Uh, 1.4 or 2.8 depending on the person's features you know if their skin is um if they're having an off skin day then i'll shoot at 1.4 focus really focus on the eyes so if it's a bit better then i'll do at 2.8 to get a bit more depth into the the picture but um yeah it's i i, I do like to make it a bit more cinematic and stand out from perfectly lit headshots there's nothing wrong with those. I just like mine to be cinematic and a bit more grungy, basically. And of course, you've got the advantage of seeing that you're you're using um, LEDs. You've got yeah. the advantage of actually being able to see what the light's doing. Exactly. I know you do have more than lamps on, on strobes, but I think strobes can throw some people off with a flash going off every, you know, two, three seconds. But, you know, you're absolutely right with uh, with the constant light. I can actually just... You know that the light for me is just with an arm's reach from my camera so i can just move it left or right. if i want the background to be a bit darker then i just move it across their face so there's no like the background if i want it more lit then i just move it onto the background so i can sort of look through the viewfinder and fix the light myself just by changing the directional of the of the um the softbox so it's um sort of a uh, my own remote control light box or stuff. I can just move myself by not moving anywhere. So so you said you, you eventually, so you moved on from using strobes to uh, using constant lighting. Yes. Um, was that a big step for you or, or did you find it relatively straightforward? <laughs> it was a big step because the, the, all of the settings have to change within the camera as well. I can't shoot at... Uh, f8 or f9 with the strobe without the light being right close up to them so now it has said it is about um with the focusing system on the lumix the the eye focus on it is is tack sharp so i i can just hold the camera either on the tripod and it does the focus and for me does the hard work for me uh but yeah going from strobe to constant was um it was a not a a complete disaster it, it took some time i had to do some test shots on it but uh, for me it's i i don't think i would go back to strobe now i do have strobe sitting in the cupboard collecting dust but i think leds personally what i feel very comfortable using so so how so, do you deal with uh with shutter speed for example when you're when you're shooting uh, close to <laughs> if it is um I, I can't, obviously I can't really sort of photograph, uh, say I have a belly dancer here, I can't photograph them and freeze the, the motion. The the most I, mean, I do have is where I get people to turn their heads left or right, then they stop for that. So the shutter speed for me, it is uh, 
Yeah, I mean, that's I'm shooting at 1.8, 1.4, 2.8. So the shutter speed isn't really that fast. And I found if I go above uh, 125th of a second, especially if I'm doing uh, film and slates for actors, you do get that flicker from the light. So it's, it's no higher than 125th of a second, which is still quite fast, but I can't capture fast moving people if they want to juggle or anything like that. So. But of course, if somebody's sitting for you, for example, there's, there's really no need um, to go there's any faster. Really than that. not. Now it's the same with having the. There's a whole thing with um, the Nikon twenty four to seventy. I'm not sure if it has or uh, stabilization built in just now. The old camera that I had that had it built in, but it's on a tripod anyway. So I just had it turned off. There's there's no point to have it on if it's on a tripod. So. Yeah. See, yeah. my my twenty four to seventy is the Nikon. Uh, and that's all that doesn't even have any stabilization. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never needed I've never needed it. Uh, did no, I? no, no, I've, I've never needed it outside. Uh, so I'm not too sure what people are actually need to have stabilization for to be able to get that. But obviously some people need it. I, I don't, my, my people don't move around that much. Yeah. Um, I have a, I use a, a, also quite an old um, 70 to 200. Right. Uh, which has st uh, stabilization built in, but I turn it off most of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah my point. old uh, Tamron, the the first generation seventy two hundred, that didn't have it built in. But again, it was on a tripod, so it, it doesn't need. So uh, yeah, so so my old Nikon seventy two hundred, well, the Tamron seventy two hundred, it was a very good lens. I, I used to use it a lot for wedding ceremonies, and that for, that worked very well. There's obviously the newer version of it, which is obviously a lot better, but I I never use the stabilization control on any of the lenses that do have it. It's just, it's counterproductive when it is on a tripod because the lens actually does shake with it stopping it. So I always just turn it off now. So now we talk about lenses and focal lengths. Um, what's your like go to focal length when you're, when you're shooting your portraits? Or headshots? Um, <clears throat> well, what do you vary? I, I do vary sometimes for, I can get a full body shot. Uh, in this in the living room where I shoot, but I do have to sort of sit on the back of the sofa. It works. Uh, could it be better? Could it be a longer living room? Absolutely. But I sort of tendency to go to like from fifty to thirty five millimeters on that. Uh, I do want at some point to get um, a prime thirty five for the Lumix, but I do have a fifty two fifties for the Lumix, the one point eight and the one point four. Uh, the one point four is it's very good, but it's very heavy. So that's the one that primarily stands on the tripod. It's, it's a heavy camera and heavy lens to, to carry around all day. So, so when I'm outside, it's at 1.8. It's you know a bit like a nifty 50, like the Canon all nifty 50. It's light and, and it's good. <laughs> it really does work well. So yeah, I mean, that's, yeah I so it's, it's 35 and 50 millimeters. I shoot a lot with an 85 1.8. Right. Um, which is actually... It's an awesome lens. It really is tech sharp. The um, Nikon one, yeah. Yeah, the Nikon one, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've got one as well. I couldn't believe how sharp it was. It's incredible. incredibly sharp. Yeah. And, and um, you know, at 1.8 is, I mean, typically, that's really all I need. I very rarely shoot headshots that shallow, right. by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I usually, I'm probably more closer to 5.6, I guess. Okay. You know, yeah, 4.5, yeah, yeah. 5.6, something like that. Um. And that gives me, it's not super shallow, but it's just kind of shallow enough that you, so the fall off starts with the ears. Yeah. So you can kind of see the ears falling off. Yeah, and, exactly. And that's, um, so rather than having like, you know, super sharp eyes and then an out of focus tip of the nose, nose you know. <laughs> that's, I have noticed that sometimes on mine and I'm like, okay, that could be a bad I mean, that that's sometimes when I do go to, F2, F2.8, just to get the eyes and the nose a bit in focus. But especially if the person's face is at an angle, then I will just shoot at 1.8 because as long as the eye that's closest to the camera is sharp, this one back here doesn't really matter. So it's it would look strange if I focus on this eye here and this eye was out of focus. So I always focus on eyes closer to the camera. But um, yeah, for, for when it is like just straight on headshots, it will be like F2, F2.8. So I do get the nose. I don't want a blurry nose. No one wants a blurry nose and a headshot. So, oh, uh, you know, I, I very recently switched to um, a Nikon mirrorless, 
and right. with eye detection and i'm telling you man it, it's like it's a it's divine a game changer i know totally total game changer it's like a divine <laughs> invention <laughs> you know? um it's such such a difference i never because i always used to say like well i don't have a problem getting sharp eyes i mean it's no 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 i move the box over the eye it's easy you don't know problem <laughs> That's um, what I was thought. <laughs> but it's it makes such a difference. You know, one major difference for me is that I can actually I can come away from behind the camera. Yeah. Because you know, I've got the camera on the tripod and I can literally get away from the viewfinder and rely on the camera to hit the eye. Which yeah. is which is it's, phenomenal. For me, yeah, it's ten out of ten every single time I get eye focus, it gets the shot every single time. It's absolutely incredible. And when I first saw that happen and it was like uh I heard like a choir of angels in front of my camera, like, oh. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I felt like it's a total idiot because people have been telling me to switch to mirrorless like for years and years. And I'm like, oh, I'm fine. You know, my DS750, I like the thing, you know, whatever, no yeah. problem. Yeah, um, uh, but it really, even now, just recording this, like just recording video, it's, I mean, it's such a game changer. You know, previously I had to go through this whole um, ritual of making sure that. You know, I could get myself in focus. I had to take my camera back and put it on my chair and focus yeah. on that, you know, <laughs> and then, then just hope for the best. You know, now I can just, you know, I had to shoot at, uh, well, at least 5.6, you know, maybe 7.1 or something, just to make sure I had enough, you know, uh, Hold depth your face of field. And focus, yeah, 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 so I could move around a little bit and still be sharp. <laughs> you know, now I do nothing. I mean, I literally do Z. I do nothing. I just put the, Add it on. the camera. Yeah, I turn it on. It, it grabs my eye. I can see on my little review screen that it's got the square mark. I can move around. It's just following me around. It follows, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's like witchcraft. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. So, Basically. you know, it, was, it makes me chuckle when I uh, <laughs> when I listen to reviews. They go, like, oh, but, you know, the Nikon uh, I autofocus isn't as good as the Sony and the Canon. It's like, how good do you need it to be? Exactly. <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know? <laughs> It's supposed to focus on your eye of your unborn child's son's eye before it's even born. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, so I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I've had I've had no problems with the 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 eye focus on on the Lumix at all. It is it's flawless as far as I'm concerned. I'm sure there is a few more software updates to do, but as far as the focus, I'm more than happy as it is. I I get that if you know, if you're I don't know if you're shooting sports different story because things are yeah. moving fast you know yeah or even if you're a wildlife photographer now you even you get like bird i want to focus or something yeah like, bird, bird detection i focus oh no it's mental but yeah okay these things move fast i get it but as a portrait photographer mm. i mean you don't even i mean you really you know if i auto focus is the, is the one thing that's keeping you from buying a camera that should not be the deciding factor no no not at all not at all i think at that point you should uh rely on your skills as a photographer and pretend that the eye focus is not there have on manual focus i mean great now it has the peaking focus so you can focus and have like the shades of red on the eye but you shouldn't yes you said you shouldn't have which that shouldn't be your design factor to go from to mirrorless you know if it doesn't have the best one ever they're all claiming to have the best focus ever now, so. Yeah, well, exactly. You know, talk about, uh, talk about the 35 earlier. I have a manual, a really old Nikon manual, um, like manual focus 35. Yeah. And it's, it's actually, it's like a, it's, it's like a relief shooting with that because yeah. you completely forget about all the, you know, technical aids. things down. Oh. In a good uh, way. Absolutely. It slows yeah. things down. You don't have to worry about autofocus. And it's it's weirdly freeing, you know? Yeah. yeah. That's what I find. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, I had a, I think my very first camera was a Fuji Finepix 5700, like a bridge camera. Hmm. Uh, comparison now is it's like when you get out of a Christmas cracker. It's, it was good at the time, but it's not now. But I have uh, I had a, my first digital camera was a Nikon D three thousand, so it's, this has gone quite back some time. But I actually used my dad's fifty millimeter from nineteen eighty one, and obviously there's no autofocus on that, so you actually have to manual focus it. Obviously, crop sensor the the image view is tiny, but when you nailed a shot outside doing street photography, it was it was fantastic. But now you can get this here. You can just I can hold my Lumix camera 
point at someone, turn my head, and it will get the focus, it will focus the eye, and it'll be fantastic. But have it used in manual lens manual lenses on newer systems. It's very liberating. It's a very liberating experience to do. You know, you, you are forced to slow down. Sometimes I will put my uh, back view of my camera, I'll flip it over so I will just be in all intents and purposes a film camera so I actually don't see what I've shot until I actually download the pictures. So then again it makes you sort of slow down and think about what you're shooting even if it is just a portrait. It's just too easy just to press your finger down on continuous mode and just shoot off 50 shots and hope one is good. Whereas you just take your time and breathe, uh, the, the results are so much better. So. Yeah, and slowing down is, I think it's really quite important, especially when, you know, for me anyway, is like when I have, you know, when I shoot a number of clients, um, you know, in a week or something, I always find that although I've changed the way that I that I work and I'm not really working against the clock anymore. Right. Um, I still feel like I can't really slow down. You know, I have to get as much done in as little time as possible. It's just a normal yeah. pressure of the job, I guess. You know, yeah. um, but then sometimes putting yourself in a position where you can actually just take a step back, you know, slow down and actually just enjoy taking pictures. Enjoy yeah. the process. Like, yeah. Enjoy the process. I mean, for me, I mean, my sessions, they do last anywhere from two to three hours. I don't stress people. People will call me and say, I'm going to be late. I'm like, so? Be the only person I'm going to shoot today, so don't stress it. Because if they come here stressed before you can get in the door, I'm going to have to spend time de-stressing them, you know, from either dog therapy or, you know, having a coffee or sitting down until I actually see that stress just fall off the shoulders. Um, I don't really want to start shooting someone who's stressed out before they even get here. It's it's not, it's no fun. The images look terrible, um, regardless of one light or not. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think people should just slow down quite a bit. Do you, how do you normally it. how do you normally start your session? Do you, do you do something to relax your your subject to start with her? Yeah, I mean, for the the studio setup I have, it is a um, I think it's a two and a half meter wide backdrop. I use the reverse side of the backdrop because it's a lot more interesting than the actual hand painted side. So it's like a, like a natural hessian type potato sack color. Of shot at one point four, that just goes nice and blurred out. It's it looks it looks hand painted, but it's not. But anyway, so the everything's set up. So they'll come in, take the shoes off, because that's what people do in Sweden. They take the shoes off when they come in the house. I'll make them coffee, give them some water. We'll go through. We'll sit down. I'll say, make yourself at home. They'll sit down. We'll drink the coffee. We'll talk. Um, I'll talk about what jobs they have up and coming, because that's something that, that they're proud of. So they want to... Um, tell me what how what, since they've last been there were like six months ago or a year ago they said, oh i've done this here i've done this here so it, i will spend about 40 45 minutes just talking to them you know about the weather you know you know covid or wherever it is whatever topics on at the news at the moment i'll talk about it uh then when i sort of feel that they have sort of melted into the couch or the chair and so okay We'll stand up, get some test shots. Don't worry about this here. Just stand in front of the camera. These are just going to be test shots for me to get the light how I want it to. I've already got the light how I want it to. I just want them just to be in front of the camera and not stress about having this object, you know, uh, 90 centimeters away from their face. So it's, it's a, and I talk a lot as well during the sessions, and that's a big distraction for them, and it, it, it works. So yeah, uh, so yeah, it's, it's 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 when I see them stress or their nervousness go away. That's when I get them to stand up. Then we start taking some casual shots, crack some jokes, and just go from there. I always remember this thing. It's like a it's like a circle or a box, you know, where your attitude dictates um, how you know how they're feeling. That then uh, dictates what their attitude is, which then dictates how you're feeling. Yeah, and so it goes right around, you know, in a sense. <laughs> it is. It's, it's like it's like cat and mouse type. Yeah. If I'm stressed, they're stressed. Oh, I see them getting stressed. I get more stressed because they're stressed. And they're getting stressed because I'm getting more stressed. So the, the, one of the biggest things 
tips that I give to people uh, above anything else is just to breathe. Just breathe naturally. And when I see them breathing normally, not holding their breath between shots, which you can notice people holding their breath, once I see them breathing naturally and slowly, that's when it starts to get the good headshots that come out, the ones that I post on Instagram or Facebook, that's when they start to relax and enjoy themselves. So since you're uh, shooting with constant light, yes, um, the, the subject or the client is not necessarily aware when you're taking a shot. Exactly. Do you think that's, do you think that's an advantage? Uh, and I, yeah, I, I sort of, I, I will sort of mainly focus on headshots. Uh, but I will sort of provide them with all of the good shots from the session. So I shoot 70, 80, 90 shots and 50 of those are really good. I'll give them all 50 photographs. I have no need to sit on 45 photographs when they're only going to get three. It makes no sense. And the more photographs they have, the more chance of them using them and more chance of me being seen by other people. Uh, but yeah, as far as continuous going, I will put the... Sometimes I'll put the camera on silent mode, so I'll, put, I'll have my hand on the shutter, talk to them. <clears throat> so they'll be talking with their hands, doing expressive Good. stuff. So I'll be like, when I sort of see them going to raise their hands to say, and I had this massive burger, I'll take that picture of them doing this type of face. And I'll give that as a picture as like a, a behind the scenes type shot as, um, as an additional shot to show a non headshot type photograph. So it's showing their face in a very relaxed um, way. You can't really <clears throat> get people to look surprised. I like, look surprised, it just looks fake. So I'll say something stupid. I have to get them to laugh when you get the whole sort of bane in the head. So when I get those type of shots, it will be in con uh, on silent mode. So I'll just press away. Once I feel I've got enough, I'll turn it back on. Then I'll start shooting where they can actually hear the digital shutter so people like to hear, have a, a sound so they can actually prepare themselves for the next shot but <clears throat> biggest advice is just to get them to breathe naturally yeah, yeah I mean, that, that, that can be an advantage or a disadvantage depending on how you look at it i always find that you know when 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 i'm shooting a, a professional model the you know the sound the flash from the strobe or even the beep from the light or the shutter you know some kind of that. reference just it, <clears throat> it, it's actually it works well because they just know when to switch to the next pose, oh, you know, exactly. and, and unless you're like very uh, definitively directing the shoot, you know, you could just literally just go click, they move to a different pose, click, another pose, click, another pose, yeah. which which is great. You know, it's a great time saver. And when you work with somebody who really knows what they're doing, you can get a lot of really awesome stuff out yeah. of them. Yeah. Um, you know, you're kind of letting the model dictate the shoot a little bit, yeah. of course. Absolutely, but, yeah. But certainly... I find that in the beginning, for the first ten minutes, fifteen minutes, or whatever, that's always a good, that's a good sort of thing. And then I like the kind of sort of two mind creativity there because for me, it's I can see what you know what the person does, and that very often sparks sparks off additional ideas in my head when I see them, yeah. you know, break into some pose. I kind of go, oh, that's actually very cool. I didn't know you could do that with that arm. <laughs> But that's yeah. you said. I'm always doing that. <laughs> it works quite well. It works quite yeah. well. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the first time I actually did work with a professional model, uh, it was someone that I asked because uh, she was half Swedish, half Norwegian, very blonde hair, very blue eyes, very pale skin. She was going, she was going somewhere on assignment, so she came here about eight o'clock in the morning, and it was like forty minutes. And it was pretty much click, a keeper, click, keeper, click, keeper. So it was like, out of that time, it was like 70 shots, and every single shot was a keeper. And I was like, and the thing is that I don't want everyone to be like that because then that's no challenge for me as a headshot photographer. You know, there's just no skill in that. You might as well just get your own mobile phone and just click away yourself. But yeah. I did a shoot uh, some time ago um, with, with a professional model, but she was actually a drummer. Right, so okay. so that's one thing you know we connected because I don't know before you know before we started to shoot, we we're just talking and she said, oh you know I studied drums, I'm actually a drummer in a band, and I'm like oh that's really awesome, you know I studied guitar, so we immediately like you know had a conversation going, yeah. And the, the funny thing was that she had kids approximately the same age as my kids, 
And so the whole shoot was like, she running through all sorts of different poses whilst we were having this conversation about drumming and kids. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's totally weird. You know? I think I, I wish I'd filmed any sort of, you know, behind the scenes footage or something. It was, it was a hilarious yeah. Ex yeah. exchange. But, um, but the results are really good. But yeah. she just knew, she just knew what poses look good under those lighting conditions, yeah. you know, for her. Yeah, exactly. And so, like, she was super professional in that respect, which yeah. was awesome. No, no, it's really good. One of the things I sort of do ask for, ask people when they do come here and I sort of said, um, do you take selfies a lot? And they're like, no. I was like, great. <laughs> that way I can, <laughs> that way they're not going to be stuck in a certain pose of doing like the whole Oh yeah, like lip pipe thing. So, <laughs> so from from that point of view, I know how much I have to um, train them into not doing the social media type poses, which they're not. Uh, so, thankfully, a lot of them aren't big selfie shooters. But the ones that are selfie shooters, they have to be sort of that's not your best side, that's your best side. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. But when people know their angles, it makes life so much easier. Hmm. So much. Do, do you think has that become, or has that increasingly become an issue? Do you think the like uh, social media selfie mm -hmm. generation? Uh, I, I think it has. Um, again, thankfully, I mean, a lot of the people I shoot are, are are student actors and working actors, professional actors. So a lot of them do have their TikTok pages. A lot of them do like to do behind the scenes on set so they do have a perceived image of you know holding the camera way up high so they're looking into it and that's not how headshots are and that, that's another thing as well i found as well is it, it does have it can have quite big effects uh because when i sort of take pictures of people that do have social media and they do take selfies the the face that they do is very similar to the ones they take themselves and that's not what I want to do. That's not what casting directors want to see. They see that every day on Instagram or TikTok. So it is a case of training them not to do that in a short period of time. So, but, and also, um, I mean, that's it's gonna be clear. That's that's not why they come to you now either. Because you know, if that was the case, then but I'll just take their own headshot. Yeah, but what I <laughs> think as well is 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 we're talking about focal lens. That's going to veer off very quickly but the i'm not sure what focal length it is on most mobile phones at 27 millimeter or something like that it's, it's quite wide so when people take selfies of themselves with their mobile phones on the underground then i take a picture with an 85 millimeter they're like that's not me i said that's how you look i'm sorry but your mobile phone lens is is a wide it's a super wide angle lens the, the, I think they sort of say is that the fit between 50 and 85 millimeters what the human eye sees, not 27 millimeter. So people are a bit shocked when they actually see themselves for the first time of actually how they should look. Uh, so yeah, so it's a bit of a shock for people. Exactly, and of course the choice of focal length um, for me is is very much dictated not only by somebody's facial shape, for example. Yeah, um, but it's also you know, I use it as a psychological icebreaker uh, in a way, uh, because what, what I tend to do is I tend to start the session off, in most cases, not always, but I usually start it off with um, a 70 to 200. Right. And the reason, I, the reason I do that is because I'm further away from the subject. Yeah. So if I don't know the, um, the client, we've never met before, we've, of course, we've had a chat when they come in and, yeah. you know. Um, but because the whole experience of lights flashing, in my case, I shoot with strobes, you know, this this whole thing of having like reflectors there and, you know, soft box and lights going off left, right and center um, and you know, having a big lens in their face. What I tend to do is by starting with a 70 to 200, I'm actually further away from them. Yeah. So as the session progresses, I'll eventually switch to the 85, where by right. default, I'm much closer in their face. Yeah. But yeah. by that point, we've already gotten to know each other to a degree where that's cool. You know, yeah. they, we've already built up the trust and the they're fine. space can get closer. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And the funny thing is, you know, when it comes to the image selection at the end, yeah, I can guarantee you that four out of five images that they pick are going to be shot with the 85. Yeah, absolutely. Every time. Yeah. Now, you know. it's, uh, you, that, that, that's actually 
quite funny to say it because I, I used to shoot with a 70 to 200. I could shoot in here with a 70 to 200, but always at 70 yeah. millimeter. So there was quite a bit of a distance. But then when I went started to shoot with a, um, when I did get 85 millimeter, I was, I mean, the focus, focal range from that is quite, it's about a meter or something with the 85 millimeter, the Nikon. It's, it's not that close, but you're still a lot closer than you are with a 70 to 200. And since there's not that really big bit of glass in front of you, you do sort of, become closer now I'm shooting with a 50 millimeter so I want someone to turn their shoulder I can just pretty much reach out and just tag their shoulder in which direction I want so I'm exactly. that close so the other thing of course that kind of sort of dictates which focal length you use sometimes is it's just simply your shooting space yeah exactly yeah, if you if you're in a small room you might not be able to use it 7200 no, no, you know no. um I have the advantage here that my space is relatively long yeah so it's actually three, I mean, it's three rooms, technically speaking. So there's an extension behind me, which is right. my shooting space. Um, then there's the space where I'm sitting in now, which is basically my editing yeah. office space. And then the living room is right there. But it's one long space that I guess used to be three spaces. Right. This whole like right. open plan. So so I can literally be the back of the living room and shoot somebody in there in in there with a seventy two two hundred lens because yeah, I can yeah. I can get the distance. That's it's not fantastic. very wide. No, but it's no. just longer. Yeah, as long as you have the the length in the room, that's absolutely fine. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, for me, it is definitely dictated to on the on the length of the room. You know, it's probably I don't know uh, fifteen fifteen and a half foot sort of length that I have. And obviously, I do use a tripod. There's the backdrop that has to go, which is pretty much directly in front of the TV. Uh, so <clears throat> yeah, I think it is dictated to me. Um to use when i had the neck on i, I use the 35 i use the dx format on a full frame camera you can just turn off the set and it, you do have a, quite a bit of vignetting but it does work quite well on it uh, a lot lighter as well especially in the d810 but yeah for me my sort of go-to focal length purely for this base is 50 millimeter at the moment which Oh, I think it was you who told me last time to try out the 35mm yeah, the DX, DX on, a, yeah. on an FX body, and I did do that, and it was awesome. Is this, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it was like a brand new lens for me. <laughs> I, 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 used, I, I didn't use that much on the DX, because it's more like a 52 on a crop sensor. When you have it on the thing, it is like a full-blown 35mm. It's not the best, but it does work. It's great for street photography. Oh, and the vignetting is actually really quite interesting, because you can yeah. totally make that work artistically. Absolutely. You know, it's the same with the this this old manual thirty five that I've got. Um, that has it has some vignetting going yeah. on there. It's noticeable. It's not as, as strong as as using a thirty five TX, but um, and by modern standards, you mm -hmm. would look at that and you would say, "Well, there's something wrong with that lens." Yeah, but but actually, that is the character of that lens, and so yeah. you just you know you make it you make it work artistically. It I, I, th I think as far as using all glass on on digital cameras, it just adds something that new lenses can't provide. You have to start and you need to start using filters to add ghosting or vignetting and stuff like that. So I think there is a definite charm to using manual focus lens on new cameras. So you know, just because I don't use shoot film anymore, they can, it can still be used, especially the Nikon lenses. I think as far back as seventy nine, right up to present, the you know the F bayonet hasn't changed since. Um, apart from the the mirrorless cameras now, I think they need an adapter. But um, yeah, when I used the fifty on the D three thousand, it was small. I did have to sort of because that was more like a seventy five millimeter on a DX format. So it was a case of I did have to sort of watch for stuff coming quite a bit in front of me you know pick a focal point for people to come up to like a spot on the ground then click it don't look at the amounts of past me then just walk ahead so i don't get called by someone taking <laughs> a picture so. <laughs> and just you know just to clarify for all those canon and sony shooters and yeah. panasonic shooters out there when we, when we talk about fx and dx well, um, as far as the nikon system is concerned dx uh, stands for the crop sensor system and fx is the, the full uh, 35 mil sensor, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, full format. Well, I've forgotten the name of it. <laughs> My brain has just gone bald. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so so DX is the the APS-C crop sensor. Exactly, it's a crop system. sensor. 
yeah. part of the, the, the full frame. Well, I do like the on the Nikon, you can actually switch between full format and DX on it. So if you do have a 35, you can go up to a 50 on that. So you just change it so you can go back and forward. So you rather than that, if you just got the one lens, you can get two focal lens out of it, which and is that was a real, handy. That was a real advantage. Um, when I remember I moved, I started with a DX system. I, mean, I can't remember what the model was exactly, but it was an APS-C um, yeah. crop sensor camera. Uh, and of course, you know, I accrued a number of lenses and then eventually I moved up to um, to full format. And then the first thing is, well, well now I'm going to have to sell all of my lenses or get rid of them or you know, spend lots of money on new lenses. But you don't really, because you can actually still use those lenses. You can still use them. I think Nikon users are very lucky in that sense. I think Canon, uh, I, I, I've never used Canon. I, I don't dislike Canon, I've just never used it. I've just, Nikon's all I've ever known um, until I've started uh, with their Panasonic, the Lumix system. So yeah, uh, having the ability to use 30, 40 year old lenses on new camera bodies, it's, it's like owning a new bit of glass again. So. Yeah, using classic lenses is always is always good. I'm actually um, I'm really quite interested in trying out some lens baby um, lenses. Just okay. to kind of you know just to jazz it up a little bit. Yeah, um, absolutely, the- absolutely. What what I actually do use on some of my portraits. I mean, I have to take down my living room lamp because the lights my boom arm won't fit in here, so I have to take it down. But the bulbs that I use, I'll you hold those in front of the fifty millimeter, so it does give a bit of a a blurred ghost type effect. So I, I won't use it for headshots because it, it, I use it more for artistic licensing. Else, so you do it's for the one I have. It's got like a bit of a a gold tone to it. So when it's shot in color, there is it's like a, a sort of a distortion. And the wherever I hold it on the camera, there's a bit of distortion on on the picture. So someone will have like a like a third eye here, but it'll it looks good. Not everyone's going to be great, but it has a bit of a a different look just to like a, a perfectly solid picture but yeah the, the lens baby i think it will be quite good do you know if they have those for the um for lumix or not or would you get an adapter for those i don't know it's the answer to that i've always been interested in doing that when i had the nikon but then i think at the time i went over to lumix i couldn't anymore <laughs> so. yeah yeah i'm not sure it's really something um i have to look into yeah um, in fact if any of if any of the viewers um, or listeners know or, or use lens baby maybe in conjunction with the Panasonic. Yeah. Um, then then get in touch and let us know. Um, in fact, you know you're always invited to leave a comment. Um, you know leave us a little review. That'd be absolutely awesome because it does help the podcast being found. Actually, the more action is going on in the background, the yeah. better. So you know if uh, if you are out there wherever you are, uh, actually I tell you what we love to ca- uh, to shout out um, listeners from time to time, and I've just come across. Uh, somebody who must be listening from a place, I think it's in the northern United States, or maybe it's southern Alberta, I'm not entirely sure. It's a place called Big Timber. So if that's you listening in Big Timber, um, get in touch, because uh, that's that's a funny name. It just jumped out at me. Uh, Big there's, Timber. There's, like a, there's a little map um, on the on the audio version of the podcast. It's in the, you know, in the background, basically. It's a little map where wow. I can see where people are listening from. Um and this is like in the broader sense, by the way. This is probably within a 500 mile radius, I guess, or something, you know. Yeah. But there's a there's a place uh, that pops out all the time that's that's called Big Timber, um, and yeah. I I don't know. It just jumps at me. It jumps out at me every time. So I really want to know who that is. Who is listening in in or around Big Timber? If that is you, please get in touch uh, because it'd be super awesome to to hear from you <laughs> and to know okay. what you're doing when you're listening to the Camera Shake podcast. Obviously, yeah. this is where we interrupt our regularly scheduled programming for a new segment that we call What is Dave Up To Now? where we follow Dave Williams and his latest adventures due north. I hope you can see me and I hope you can hear me because the wind is crazy so I've got my mouth covered and most of my face covered. But uh, anyway, hi, Camera Shake Podcast. Uh, I'm Dave Williams, I'm here in the Lofoten Islands in Norway. The island that I'm on is called Flagstadoia. This E10 that passes around behind me, all the way around this fjord. And then behind me in that direction, we have Nusfjord. So I'm pretty far out to the west in the Lofoten Islands. 
and today we're going to talk about some tips for shooting the northern lights tip number one which is where you are now and that camera and that camera is use a tripod oh hello starting to dance over there um, make sure you use a tripod because it's a long exposure it's nighttime photography so you're going to be shooting long exposures of at least a second uh, I've got a time lapse going on on that camera which is doing one second exposures but if you want a good still photo of good few seconds is what you're going to need think about combining nighttime photography with waterfalls the northern lights are moving they dance across the sky they move the water in waterfalls moves the longer the exposure the smoother it's going to be the faster the exposure the more you're going to freeze that motion so balance using the widest aperture you have balance your shutter speed in your iso so that you can get the best northern lights the best movement that you want and with the minimal amount of noise in the photo and when i say noise in the photo just remember that now there are so many apps like topaz and luminar and on one that will get rid of the noise oh hello we've got some arcs forming above us now as well this is beautiful um, they'll get rid of the noise that we don't want and help us tidy up our photo um, and another thing to remember is that there is a slider in photoshop to add noise noise is not a bad thing it's more important that, in fact kirsten said it beautifully if there's noise in the photo and people point it out it's bad anyway it's not bad because of the noise it's just bad so anyway thanks for having me again camera shake podcast i'll catch up with you again in another episode from the Lofoten Islands in northern Norway where there is a gale force 7 warning in effect and it is negative and quite humid and therefore flipping freezing I'm Dave Williams thank you very much see you next time let's talk about directing um, your your models or your subjects uh, we, we sort of we talked about this a little bit but I think it would yeah. be worthwhile to dive into that in a little bit more detail because if somebody's thinking to get into portrait photography, then you know the lighting is one thing, you know, using the right lens is another thing, you know, camera settings and everything. But but then when you actually have a human being in front of you, then it's really your job as a photographer to direct them and to tell them what it is that you want them to do yeah. because clearly they can't see themselves. You're the one who's looking through the viewfinder. Exactly. Uh, the, the, I used to use a lot of verbal communication for for my sessions, <clears throat> and I think uh, that the, there is no language barrier uh, in Stockholm English to a lot of Swedes is like a joint first language, not like a joint second language. It is a joint first language. They speak just as well as 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 most Brits do, um, but still, I found it a lot more efficient. When I wanted people to turn their head left or right, I'll say, you know, point your no nose at my finger. When it stops, that's when I get them. That's when they stop their head. I want them to tilt their head. I'll say the index fingers on their forehead, the chins on their thumb. I'll get them to tilt the head, which I really is. So rather than listen to like turn your head three point six seven centimeters to the north northwest, I just use hand directions. To get them to turn their head because everyone has got like a a good and a better side of their face a lot of people don't know that a small tip that i get or a hint that i get is if they have their hair parted on this side of the head that's the side that they favor us on this side that's the side that they favor so it's a case of as soon as they stand up in front of the camera from having a coffee I'll be looking at them that like using the peripheral vi vision saying, okay, they're part from that side of the head. I'll get them to turn the body against the light, turn the head this way here. So the body's looking across the body and you know, it, it doesn't take too long to start getting good shots. I, I think some people get 10 shots before they start getting good, uh, some good photographs. Uh, some people get it within the first five shots, but it's, it's all about reading people's body language 
you know, are, are their shoulders held back? Uh, are they are they crouched over? But the, one of the things that I do get them to do, as far as uh, standing, you you think standing would be an easy thing for people to do because considering they do it for most of the day is. If they don't have good posture, I pretend, get them to pretend they've got a hook on top of the head and just imagine that hook going all the way down the spine and just imagine that pulling them up and that sort of pulls the shoulders back as well. Uh, so I do keep my direction short and swift because I want them to sort of focus on something else other than the camera. And if they are not focus the folks on the camera they just go a bit you know rabbit in the headlights they just they just go blank so you know i'll just get them to pretend that they're thinking about what they're going to have for this evening's dinner so i'll just get them to say well i'm going to have you know chicken curry or whatever it is into the head so then they're focused on what they're going to have to eat rather than the camera so it's putting their focus away from that so but, um, talking about the talking about the language, Barry. Did you ever have anybody come to you and says like, "Oh, yok prata into elsk"? Is it what? Well, <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I I actually have, I actually have had four or five sessions where they've only spoke Swedish, right? Uh, and it is a confidence thing. It is a confidence thing for me. I know a lot of Swedish. I just have my confidence is not that great to speak it. The only time I have spoken, it, someone thought I was Norwegian, so I was like, "That's not what I'm going for." <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> it's, a case, it's a case of you know that they, they they understand English. Uh, I understand Swedish, so they'll speak Swedish through the session. I'll speak English in the session, yeah. and you know as long as we can communicate and understand each other, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, so there's about four or five sessions where I've had that. The first one was a bit a bit scary because it was like I was understanding out of ten words, I was understanding four words, and then I was having to like figure out what they were saying by the words that I did know. So yeah, language barrier is, is is not an issue at all anymore, which is good. You know, I found that um, when I when I went to music college in London, um, it, it was it was an international college, and I ended up playing in a band with four Swedish people, three Swedish backing singers, and a Swedish drummer. Right, and it was awesome, I have to say. Uh, and I'm quite good with languages. I, I did pick up quite a bit relatively quickly i guess yeah but far i mean far from me being able to understand the swedish fluently or something yeah i just yeah. you know i just picked up like certain things like yeah <laughs> you know uh, because that makes sense if you think about it um but you know and i, I remember i remember going to a party it was a swedish party um and and everyone was speaking Swedish, and uh, you know the drummer in my band, a guy called Matthias, you know, he comes up to me. He goes like, "Hey, man, what's up? You know, are you not enjoying yourself? You're not like you're not joining in." I said, like, "But everybody's speaking Swedish. I don't really have an idea. No. Uh, I don't I have no idea." And he goes like, "Ah, oh, no, you're really good with languages. You'll pick it up." And, <laughs> and then he left, and I'm like, "Oh wow, now I really have to pick it up." <laughs> oh shoot. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's. It. I, I thought it was going to be a lot. I, I think. If I, thought, if I was going to make it a big deal, it was going to be a big deal for me. Well, uh, I mean, yeah, I said I, I do understand a lot more Swedish than that than I speak. But again, it's a confidence thing. But everyone, thankfully in Stockholm, does speak very good English. Some actually just sound like they're from Yorkshire, whatever it is. Absolutely. Just like, that's the one thing I found. It was incredible how how great the accent was. Yeah. Um, it's just amazing. You know, as, as you know, because we've spoken about this before the show, um, I'm, my wife and I were planning on coming to Stockholm. Yeah. Um, uh, the, what, in May, I think is. But um, I really, I'm actually, I'm so looking forward to it, I have to say, uh, because like, the last time I've been in Sweden was in, oh my God, it was the late 90s. I think I did a tour in Gothenburg. So it's a long time ago. Right, right, right. So yeah, yeah so I mean, it, it, yeah, I mean, for, for now, I mean, we're so you know, on about direction in in the camera, you know, I I do use hand gestures ninety nine percent of the time. It's it saves time, it saves a lot of hassle. Like saying, turn your head left, no, not that left, your left. So it, it does speed up time. It's it, it again, it's it's another thing that people focus on. 
something other than the camera when they see my hand beside the camera, the sort of focus on the hands. So they're not continuously looking into the camera. And I don't want people to look into the camera all the time. It's only when I'm taking shots is when I get them to look into the camera. If they're not too comfortable, I was getting to look away, count to three, on three, one, two, three, into the camera, click, then they can, if they're really that nervous. But um, yeah, as, as far as if I wanted to move their left shoulder, I'll say, listen, I've got a bit of string attached to your left shoulder. I'm going to pull that when you see my hand stop, and that's when I want you to stop moving your shoulder. Because I, I can't sort of go around in front of the camera and sort of, you know, physically move people into the positions that I want to. So yeah, using hand gestures does speed things up a lot for me. Yeah, I find the same thing. I, I give them a little introductory talk, yeah, uh, to start with, you know, about about moving, you know, moving the head on three different axes and all the rest yeah, of it. Yeah, um, and that that really does help, especially for headshots. It is, especially for headshots, because um, there is certain angles that do people do look a lot better. Than other angles, you know, some people look great looking straight into the camera. Some people look a lot better just looking off at a certain angle. So, but uh, yeah, and it's uh, also interesting. It's interesting how, like, when you start with um, you know giving directions, especially for people who are not used to being yeah. in front of the camera, like you know corporate venture clients, for example, it's really interesting how quickly uh, they tend to catch on, and within like ten minutes. They literally do all the poses for you, and they move their head without you having to say anything. And then I've they- noticed that. It is, it's, it's, it's quite fascinating. I've actually had people that are shot like, um, last time I shot was like a year ago or a year and a half ago. They'll come in and they'll sort of stand how I got them to stand you know, with a hook on their head. So they will remember stuff. And they'll say, I remember this from the last time I was here. I was like, great. This is going to yeah. go, go a lot quicker <laughs> if, if, they, yeah. um, if they pick up on stuff and remember stuff. I don't mind uh, talking to people and refreshing them, but a lot of people do remember from the previous session what it's like and what they're expected to do. So, let's talk a little bit about your portrait photography. Um, I noticed your um, your portraits are very often you use, you use props quite a lot. In yes. The yeah, I, I do. Yeah, especially uh, guitar. <laughs> That's yeah. one of the things I've noticed naturally. Yeah, yeah I think the, the I think the one person she said she wanted to do a bit of a uh, a rock type. Um, uh, portrait and I said, yeah, sure. She had like a leather jacket and some sort of Danzig type t shirt on, whatever it was. I can't remember what it was. That was a while ago. But yeah, the, the, there is props that I do use. I do like using chairs as props because it's if people aren't comfortable standing with portraits, then I'll get them to sit. You know, I, I do have, I used a hat the other, the other night there, a ball hat, an old British ball hat. And again, I think it's sort of, if people aren't too sure what to do with their hands, you know, give them a prop, you know, get them to, I'll put like a, a bench for them to sort of lean against, put the hands on the bench, you know, sort of do the whole sort of hands on the table with the hands up on the chin. But yeah, props are, are good. It, it's again, it's, it's another distraction for them. And especially if it's just for like an artistic, artistic portrait, then I think it adds another bit of dimension to it. So, yeah. Um, do you shoot? I mean, I think you mentioned you're, you use a, a tripod um, a lot. Do you shoot yeah. freehand sometimes, or? Uh, yeah, I have for the um, for the portraits, uh, uh, ones where they're sitting down or on the ground, uh, that will be handheld. Uh, I, I still will use the uh, fifty millimeter. Saying that, I I totally forgot about another lens that I do have. It's a Sigma twenty four to seventy for the Lumix very good it's it's very sharp so if i do need if people are ballet dancers then i've got like the 24 millimeter range to go through but um for, for the the portraits that aren't headshots a lot of them are handheld because uh some people are like five foot two some people are two meters five so there is a quite a big difference and my tripod doesn't go up that high and it doesn't go that low so and it, it slows things down not unless it's going to be like a a still art type pose where they're sitting down with having a dog beside them uh, i like to try and keep that a bit uh flowing so it doesn't become stale the, you know the poses don't become stale so but yeah handheld quite a lot quite a lot 
Fantastic. I, I mean, <clears throat> I tend to mostly shoot with a tripod, I think. Yeah, probably, I mean, 90% of the time. That's probably just because I'm lazy <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> I, I, I think, to be honest with you, I think once I've got the headshots out of the way, once I know I've got the headshots in the basket, as it were, then I will come off tripod because then I can sort of, you know, talk to them. You have the camera in my hands, talk to it, and so there's nothing in front of me between me and them. Then I can either get really close to them, so it's like just like a frame and the whole picture with it. Especially if someone's got like an Afro type style hair or very big hair, I can frame the whole picture with hair and get really close or come back. So it, it is quite good to have a bit of um, free running, as it were, with a camera to get um, some different angles. I mean, with tripod is great, but it, you are for headshots. It's, it's it's you know it's chest up. So, but yeah, ha having the ability to be able to stand or sit. I mean, when it, the the points where I come to do the full body shots, I'm sort of sitting down on the sofa because the camera is going to be at their waist height because I want their bodies to be. Perfectly straight. We shoot wide angle up the way, and if it's a female, no female wants to have bigger hips than they actually do. So it's twenty-four millimeters, so the the, the body's ninety degrees to camera, so there's no distortion in the lens. So, which works quite well for most parts. Let's talk a little a little bit about um, your like the, the sort of this your style of of color. I would call it yeah, because it's very it's very distinctive. Um, it has this, like you know, I mentioned early on. It's it's very subtle. It's very sort of subdued. Yeah. Um, and that's your color photography. But then your black and whites are also very striking. Yeah. And yet they're striking yet subtle at the same time in a weird way. Yeah. Um, uh, how do you achieve that look? I think for the for the color, uh, I use. Uh, you do get people using the um, the gray cards to get their white balance, and that's fantastic for. If you want to get a like for like picture, I don't want to get a like for like picture as far as the color goes. I, I said I want to have like a bit of a, a cinematic type feel, so I'll use the background, or uh, or if I have like a white collar, I'll use like the um, the color picker to white balance off the shirt or white balance off the background. So it, it does add a bit of a um, greenish type tone to the overall picture. And you know, if people are wearing red, then it's going to go green, and we click on that. So it's 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 about finding the um, the right part to um, fo uh, get the white balance from. Uh, I don't want a, a perfect white balance. The same with the black and white. Uh, I I shot I shot a portrait outside yesterday. It was in a gallery, and the lights were quite horrific. Pillars when I saw okay, everything's anything with bad light is gonna look great in black and white. Swap black and white, it turned out good. The outside shots I shot in color because it was it was nice light outside, but the black and white, um I basically um put the contrast up, put the the what do you call it, the um exposure up, the uh, the highlights all the way down. The shadows all the way up so it removes all the shadows then i'll create it to black and white then i'll use the the uh, the temperature all the way down to blue so if people have got freckles it will bring out the freckles it it adds i wouldn't want to say it's like a h what do you call it or like an hdr yeah effect. basically it, it's it's like that but it's not but you do get to see a lot of detail in the shadows and it have they've got like light blue eyes that light blue eyes can really light blue and then i will just sort of once i get it then i'll just use the the color temperature i'll just push it up even though it's in black and white you will start to see sort of the the darks coming out once it looks good for me and that's where it is then i'll just copy and paste that and post on or paste onto other photographs that are in black and white it, it does work for the most part i think I use uh, Adobe Lightroom, and I think their presets have gotten a lot better than they were when was it Adobe Lightroom Five or whatever it is. When you have to actually install it by disk, uh, so yeah, so it, ha it has got a lot better. Unfortunately, headshots for a long time now aren't used in black and white. I do like black and white headshots, but people want color, so you know I have to find a good cinematic type color that's real but also a bit cinematic as well 
Yeah, a little bit hyper real. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I don't want to be. I don't want green to look green. I want or blue to look blue. I want them just to have a bit of a, a bit of a, their own sort of character to them. You know, especially with with, with skin tones. I will sort of. Yeah, because exactly you said, a bit hyper real. I just want them to be a bit standoutish, not to be controversial. It's just because I like that's the way I like my portraits to look, as you know, a cinematic screenshot of someone in front of the camera. So, I mean, that, that hyper realism. Um, that's actually a good point. You know, I, um, I do a I shoot I shoot a portrait series called Three Heads in a Row, which is yeah, which is completely hyper real. I mean, everything's hyper real about it. Yeah. So everything from the focal length to uh, because I want that distortion in there um, to the posing which is completely over the top to yeah. th the coloring which is also hyper real the, the way I start that out in terms of white balance is actually I set the white balance in camera to um, to shade uh, to cloudy okay. even. So it's, it's, yeah so I set it to cloudy yeah, um, yeah. and that gives me a really good base to work from when yeah. I then get the images into, um, into Lightroom so it kind of it's not a massive difference between setting it to flash, for example. Yeah. Um, but it's just enough to just change everything, and and it's a, it adds a warmth to the image, you know, right yeah. from the start. Exactly. And of course, you know, you can. I, of course, I, I adjust it a little bit, you know, in Lightroom afterwards. Exactly. But, yeah. Uh, but it sets a great base. It's it's, know, it's, a, it's a good starting point. Yeah. Um, uh, I think I will spend like a again if I shoot seventy headshots and there's like twenty five headshots, some are half body, some are full body, some are seated. I'll as long as the light doesn't change in, in brightness, I'll focus on one picture. Spend about I don't know five ten minutes getting the way I want it to look. Once I, I'll go off, make a copy, come back, look at it. If it still looks good, I'll copy those settings select all paste on it there might be some that i'll have to change because someone's face might be full onto the camera or the light some might be off so and they have to work some on the shadow but it's, it's a very good base to pick a white balance especially you said for like the hyper real type portraits it's, it's, it's a good starting point to work from and then you just then you go from there you know it may change over the next year but that's what photography is it's it's learning it's learning day by day yeah, it's learning and developing because I, you know, one thing I've noticed um, across that whole three years in a row series, yeah. um, which I've been shooting this for a good few years now, since before the pandemic. Yeah. Huh? Um, and on the face of it, when you look at the Instagram feed, it looks like they're all of the same. But actually, when you have a close look, you'll notice that there's sort of a, there's a development in it. It yeah. started very warm, then I dialed the warmth back a little bit to the point where. It wasn't warm enough, <laughs> you know? yeah. and it's sort of like I, when I look through it, I can see that kind of development. You know, it's like um, over over the course of like six months, my eyes have gotten used to something, or I got bored of something, an aspect in it. You know, You're and to be there's a bit blind to it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there's yeah. there's also like you know, for instance, um, I shot a good example. Is I, I shot um, a series of uh, Dave Williams in like polar gear you know with like yeah. a, like an anorak with like you know parka type thing with a furry hat and yeah uh, and an ice pick and all, all the rest of it uh, that just it, it's crying out for some cold light because yeah. you, you have a guy basically dressed like an arctic explorer yeah. you know with an ice pick you know so uh, it just made sense to dial the warmth down a little bit and make it look make a, a little cool bit picture. wintry yeah, yeah, exactly. So, absolutely. So that's you know that's that's the thing that sort of dic it very often dictates the content. Sometimes dictates. Uh, oh where yeah, the yeah, going. yeah. The the, the you know the, the color temperature of it. Yeah, I mean, there's um, uh, I have shot people with uh, quite very dark olive skin. Then some will come to me and they're pretty much like an albino. So then I actually have to, as you said, I have to reset if I especially have two sessions one day and someone comes in and their skin tones are a lot lighter or a lot darker then I'll have to adjust on that to make allowances for it even the the warmth of the picture if someone has got very old skin they can look really it's gonna look too orange and I, I don't want that you know I want them to look real but 
with a twist of lemon on it. You know, basically, it's just that Adam known yeah. touch. I think you find that a lot, but it's, it, it, in my experience, anyway, um, I found this. You know, since I moved to the UK, um, I find there there's a greater variety of skin tones in Northern Europe, as yeah. in like the UK, for example, than there would be, for instance, in the south of Germany where I grew up. Yeah. Um, because there's uh, there's some skin tones that are so white, yeah. almost like pasty white, um, <laughs> that I don't remember ever seeing typically when I grew up in the, in the south of Germany. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's not like... And then, of course, when you, when you, you go further south towards Italy, you very quickly you really notice how the skin tones darkens as you go from Northern yeah. Italy to Southern Italy, for example. Um, and it's in no way like that in the South of Germany, but it's, uh, but definitely, um, uh, you know, that was something I, I noticed when I started, when I moved to the UK and, and especially when I started photographing people here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's a major variation in, in skin, in skin tones. Tone. Yeah. 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 No, very much so. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I mean, before I moved to Africa, I was living in London for, 12, 13 years, I think it was. Uh, but before that, when I was young, growing up in in Scotland, Northern Ireland, everyone was, as you said, pasty white. It was just, especially Scots. My mother, she was whiter than white. You know, she was almost blue in, in skin tone. Uh, but, you know, when I sort of grew up, moved away, moved down to London, then you sort of see every skin type, every skin tone. And I think that would have been that. Um, I think that would be not more of a challenge. I think you would have to do a. I would have to do a lot more with white balance in London than I would do here. There is skin tones over here, but I think London would be a bit more of a more of an effort, not a bad effort, but more of an effort for me to shoot in London because there is a vast lot more uh, skin tones, which is not bad because then. Because then you have a lot, a lot more variety to choose from, but at the same time, it, it does sort of. It, I, I would, I would, I would be struggling to keep up with the amount of time that I have to change. So, so I just recently had a discussion with my daughter about skin tones because she um, she got into drawing in a big way, and right. she she's she loves drawing. She's very good at it. Um, she loves pencil type drawing, um, and she recently got well, for Christmas actually got an iPad. With a, yeah, you know, with, an, with a pencil. IPad Pro, yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, she's doing it. It's, an, it's not a Pro, it's an iPad. What's it called? Uh, iPad Air. Oh, okay. With an Apple Pencil, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. which works perfectly for her intents and purposes and for her drawing stuff. But um, we were talking about, I think we got, it started with eye colors and hair colors, and then we got on to uh, different skin tones. And it was it was interesting because I was I was trying to make her understand that when you sample different skin tones with a color picker yeah. it doesn't it doesn't really matter whether you whether you, you know whether you talk about like really dark skin tones like you know african skin tones yeah. or asian skin tones or european skin tones or whatever when you look at them on the on the on the color wheel they're extremely close together yeah you know which is remarkable so. which is really remarkable because to the eye these skin tones look very different but yet when you yeah. actually really analyze them you notice how how small the spectrum yeah, human skin tone actually, actually it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, actually, wouldn't believe me. So we took a few photographs and we we just color picked some yeah. of those, and then you know she could she could then actually firsthand see how close they are, which right. sort of which made me think. You know, it's really interesting how for some reason everybody keeps focusing on people's on differences between people when actually we're much closer. You know, than actually when, think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that many more similarities. It's very similar to this thing I listened to. Um, one of the early astronauts um was an interview i know it was it was one of the last people on the moon that's right and i remember him saying like yeah, it's really interesting you know looking down to the earth and realizing that you can't see any borders fantastic you know? yeah and once, once you live on this planet you're so preoccupied with like different countries and you know and different languages and different cultures and everything else but then once you go up into space can't see any borders at all so it's just yeah, one big thing just, yeah exactly yeah that's actually quite good in a way of looking at it, the, the similarities between the two. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's good. It's good. Fantastic. Sean, it's been an absolute pleasure having Likewise. you on the show again. Um, it's always. Again. It's uh, absolutely anytime. I'm sure it won't, won't be the last time. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> uh, for sure, absolutely. There's uh, there is so much um, so much information packed into into this episode. It was an absolute pleasure to talk to you about about portraits and about your proce uh, process. So, um, so for all of you listening, um, if you are listening to the audio version of this podcast, you'll be reminded that uh, there's a fully fledged, fully coloured beautifully colored version over on YouTube. Of course, we've been talking about color, so go and check it out over on YouTube. Um, and remember that if you are, you know, if, if you are listening, if you have listened to this far and you haven't subscribed, um, then please do that. If you're listening on Apple Podcast, you know, go down, give us a give us a five-star rating. That'd be awesome. And leave us a little comment because, again, that really helps the algorithm to find the podcast where people are, um, people are looking for it. So that'd be super awesome. That being said, It's been an absolute pleasure, Sean. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. And we shall see you again next Thursday.